Hello everybody and welcome to another reading of the book Rulers of Evil from F. Tupper Saucy. Last time I finished reading chapter 15, The Madness of King George III, and told you we're gonna continue today in chapter 16 of the book called Tweaking the Religious Right. This is, as you will see, and as you will learn probably also, a very important part of this book, a very important chapter because it speaks about a person, most and for all, that has been taken out of the history of the Americans. And we will see that later in the concluding comment that my friend Walt Stickel made that I were going to read to you after I read chapter 15, which comes now first. So, the tweaking the religious right. As the Fuhrer over the Stamp Act was cooling down, the Jesuits of Maryland and Pennsylvania discovered that the director of Catholic operations in the British colonies, Bishop Richard Chaloner, had asked Rome to ordain an American bishop. The American Jesuits disliked the idea. Father Ferdinand Steinmeier, alias Farmer, of New York, cautioned Bishop Chaloner, quote, it is incredible how hateful to non-Catholics in all parts of America is the very name of Bishop." Unquote. Still, in Chelloner's view, an American bishop would establish better order in the colonies, restore discipline and make it possible for colonial Catholics to be confirmed. Steinmeier and his American brethren strenuously opposed the idea on grounds that it would only make life among Protestants more difficult for Catholics. They collected lay support for their views and asked Chaloner himself to forward the protests to Rome, which he declined to do, leaving it to the Jesuits to state their own case. Rome never replied to Chaloner's petition for an American bishop. The bishop later discovered that the petition made in a letter to Cardinal Spinelli and entered into the post in 1764, never left England. In Bishop Chelliner's words, quote, it was opened and stopped on this side of the water, unquote. Whoever opened Chelliner's letter must have passed it con its contents on to the Church of England, for no sooner had Chelliner posted his letter than the Anglican Anglican Bishop of London, who had thus far been content to rule his American subjects from London, asked the British cabinet to permit the Church of England to create an American bishop to, quote, attend the shepherdless flock in the colonies, unquote. When word of this request reached the colonies, which were mostly Protestant but less than 15% Anglican, the reaction must have elated Lorenzo Ricci. The sons and daughters of immigrants who had braved wild Indians and rattlesnakes to escape religious prelates took the bishop's petition to be the worst act of tyranny yet, the most pressing cause for alarm, the number one thing to revolt against. The American bishop's scare was whipped up in the non-Anglican Protestant church pulpit, the era's most electrifying communications medium. Presbyterian and Congregationalist preachers, representing nearly 50% of the churched colonists, charged that an American bishop would be, quote-unquote, an ecclesiastical stamp act, which would trip, uh, strip Americans of all their liberties, civil as well as religious, and, quote, if submitted to will at length grind us to powder, unquote. They warned that an American bishop would dominate the colonial co governor and councils, strengthen the position of the colonial oligarchy, and drive dissenters from political life with the Test Act requiring officials to state their religious preference. Having brought the colonial government under its, uh, governments under its control, the American bishop would then establish the Church of Rome in all the colonies and impose taxes for the support of its hierarchy. A letter in the New York Gazette of or Weekly Postboy for March 14, 1768, charged that an American bishop would, quote, introduce a system of episcopal palaces, of pontifical revenues, of spiritual courts, and all the pomp, grandeur, luxury, and regalia of an American Lambeth, unquote. Lambeth Palace being the residence of the Archbishop of Canterbury head of all England after the royal family. 
An American bishop would transform Americans into a people, quote, compelled to fall upon their knees in the streets and adore the papal mitre as the apostolic tyrant rides by in his gilded equipage, unquote. Reverend Jonathan Mayhew, Dudleyan lecturer at Harvard, inveighed against popish idolatry in a famous and arguably prophetic sermon by, the ti by that title, saying, quote, let the bishops get their foot in the stirrup, and their beast, the laity, will prance and flounce <coughs> about to no purpose. Bishops will prove to be the Trojan horse by which popery will subjugate North America. Unquote. And here we have the Trojan horse again. The same Trojan horse that I always stated was the freedom of religious uh, liberty, the freedom of religion that was put into the Constitution of the United States of America. That was the Trojan horse to allow the Roman Catholics to do what they were forbidden in the time of the colonies. But I think we're going to go to that later again. You will see. Continue now. The American bishop scare did more to foment the colonists to revolt and eventually raised more soldiery than all the tyrannical writs and tax schemes combined. Immediately it created permanent committees of correspondence, an intercolonial organization of churches and a quote-unquote society of dissenters based in New York. These organizations brought all opposed to the Church of England into correspondence with one another, whether in America, Great Britain or Ireland. The specter of an American bishop gave the colonial patriots an almost inexhaustible fund of propaganda to employ against any form of perceived tyranny at home and abroad. It served, in Jonathan Boucher's words, quote, to keep the public mind in a state of ferment and effervescence, to make the people jealous and suspicious of all measures not brought forward by popularly approved leaders, and above all, to train and habituate the people to opposition." Unquote. The fact that Americans were trained and habituated to oppose the British crown, crown and the Church of England, not by Roman Catholics but by Protestant churchmen, is, to my mind, proof of the Sanchuan ingenuity of Lorenzo Ricci. Sanchu said, quote, the general will know how to shape at will not only the army he is commanding, but also that of his enemies." Unquote. And I think this is something you really have to think about. The real general, like the general of the Society of Jesus, does not only shape his own army, he also shapes the other armies. The Jesuits always control both sides of the conflict. They stir up. And this is actually going back to this Sun Tzu, what we read earlier, is probably even written by a Jesuit, not even by Sun Tzu. When you go back into the chapters of Rulers of Evil, you will come to that point where I read that. So I'm going to read this quote to you once again. Sun Tzu said, quote, The general will know how to shape at will not only the army he is commanding, but also that of his enemies." Unquote. While Ritchie's own army was appearing in the world's opinion markets to be a band of vicious dolts slipping down into their well-deserved oblivion, a small elite corps of indispensables, some neither knowing nor caring who their true boss was, were facilitating English-speaking Protestant churchgoers and systematically annihilating one another. Lorenzo Ricci's orchestration had reached such fullness that he could now solilo soliloquize Iago's boast in Otello, quote, Now, whether he kill Cassio or Cassio him, or each do kill the other, every way makes my gain, unquote. Back in the 1960s and 70s, Central America Jesuits designed posters to motivate campesinos to overthrow corrupt politicians. The posters for this Bellarmenian liberation theology depicted an angry Jesus Christ in the image of Che Guevara. Swathed in fatigues, 
draped in bullet belts, holding a submachine gun at the ready, a ramble Jesus, a Jesus whose sacred heart called for social action that included killing. The American Bishop Scare aroused the same dynamic in the 1770s. What was considered by many to be the most influential sermon on the subject was preached to Boston's ancient and honorable artillery company by Rev. Jonathan Mayhew's successor at Harvard, Rev. Simeon Howard. Simeon Howard received his early preaching experience in Nova Scotia, or Acadia as the French settlers called it. He experienced firsthand the uprooting and expulsion by British soldiers of some 3,000 French Catholic Acadians, along with their Jesuit priests. Cruelly, often violently, the Acadians were forced to emigrate to various American colonies with no compensation for property or livestock. Longfellow memorialized, uh, memorialized the event in his work Evangeline. With a casuistry that would have delighted Cardinal Bellarmine, Reverend Howard's famous artillery company sermon openly advocated the use of violence against a political tyrant. Our duty to defend personal liberty and property, he argued, is stated in scripture at Galatians 5 verse 1, quote, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, unquote. True. Reverend Howard admitted Christ requires us to resist no evil, love your enemies, do good to them that hate you, as stated in Matthew chapter 5. And, quote, recompense to no man evil for evil, avenge not yourselves, Romans 12, 17 and 19. But these precepts apply only to cases of, quote unquote, small injuries. Howard said, not large ones, such as tyranny. Nor, said Reverend Howard, should we fully accept Christ's commandments on property. Love not the world, nor the things that are in the world, as stated in John chapter 2, verse 5, and in Matthew 6, 19, quote, Lay not up for yourselves treasure on earth, and in Matthew 5, 42, quote, Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away." Unquote. Such precepts as these, Reverend Howard said, are indefinite expressions which we have a right to limit. Now the defensive application of lethal force is reasonable and noble and patriotic. But it is not recommended by Jesus Christ. The Jesus of the Scriptures cautions that life by the sword means death by the sword. It is Rome, not Jesus, that commands the use of lethal force. Rome, whose natural law society was built on the willingness of the individual to risk his own life in killing to preserve the religious state. And it was Rome that Simeon Howard beseeched his audience to emulate. Quote, Rome, who rose to be mistress of the world by an army composed of men of property and worth. Unquote. I just want to go a little bit back in this last paragraph that I read to this one sentence here. Rome, whose natural law society was built on the willingness of the individual to risk his own life in killing to preserve the religious state. This seems like such a normal little sentence that you read easy above without even getting deeper understanding. But may I take you back <clears throat> a little bit into the history to 1990 or 1991, I don't remember the right time, you can look that up, when George W. w George H. Bush, the father of George W. Bush, president at that time, did his speech on the New World Order. And he said that we will give up our national sovereignty and all that, and all these rights and all these freedoms we have to be ruled by natural law. Now, when you do not understand what natural law is, then look it up, because natural law is Roman law, as stated in this little, almost insignificant little sentence. Rome, whose natural law society was built on the willingness of the individual to risk his own life in killing to preserve the religious state. Natural law, 
is by what Rome ruled more than 2,000 years already. And it is coming to the United States of America as it is coming to every so-called free country in the world. Because they have infiltrated all the governments and they are behind all the governments today. And in the end it comes to the ruling of the Roman Catholic natural law. Is that what you want? Think about it. It is not the freedom that is given us in Jesus Christ. Okay, continue reading. A decade after the American bishop scare had broken out, thousands of American Protestant and Catholic churchgoers began killing and being killed to win the war that would keep Anglican bishops out of America. And they won this war. But the utterly stupefying outcome of their victory was that no bishops were kept out of America. No! Two bishops were brought into America, an Anglican and a Roman Catholic one. The Roman Catholic, of course, was... Guess it. Come on, I told you the name already. John Carroll. This Jesuit son of Maryland was consecrated bishop of Baltimore on August 15, 1790, in the chapel of Lulworth, a castle set high on the Dorset coast of England owned by the Wells, a prominent Roman Catholic family. Lulworth's upper quote-unquote red room looks to the east upon a commanding view of the estate's long entrance meadow and to the south upon a famous smuggler's cove in the distance. A frequent visitor to Lulworth Castle, and honoured guest in its Red Room, I am told, was King George III, who we learned about in Chapter 15, the one that I read before this. Bishop Carroll became the Holy See's direct representative, not just in Baltimore, but throughout the United States. This fact was validated in 1798 by Judge Edison, President of the Court of Common Pleas, of the Fifth Circuit of Pennsylvania in the case of Fromm v. Carroll. Fromm was a recalcitrant German Franciscan who wanted to establish his own German-speaking, laity-owned parish. Edison ruled that, quote, The Bishop of Baltimore has sole episcopal authority over the Catholic Church of the United States and without authority from him no Catholic priest can exercise any pastoral function over any congregation within the United States." Unquote. Fromm was excommunicated and held up as an example of what happens to, re to rebels against wholesome church authority. Edison's use of the term Catholic Church of the United States is an interesting juridical notice that Carroll's ordination instituted for all practical purposes a secular church ruled by the black papacy. Eminent Catholic historian Thomas O'Gorman concurred in 1895 observing that American Catholicism was quote, in its inception wholly a Jesuit affair and has largely remained so. Unquote. Now, I have to let make a little comment on this. When you really, in the depths, want to understand not only John Carroll, but the whole Carroll family, of course, first of all, I advise you to listen further in this book, Rulers of Evil, because they are being more exposed here than in any other book that you probably have ever read, read or any other broadcast that you have ever heard. But I really strong you, strongly advise you to go to my YouTube channel Juggler66 and check out the playlist of Tom Fraser's reading, The Global Vatican. He goes even into depths into some things that I haven't heard before of the Carols, because this is written in the book The Global Vatican, and Tom does a very good explanation of that. And then you will see that the wealth that they had as family, the Carroll family, who were one of the richest in the colonies at that time, they got all this riches by being a family of soldiers for the Pope, mercenaries, you can say, for years already before that. And this is very interesting background that you will never ever hear in any 
mainstream media or in any mainstream history book or whatever. You really have to go to watch for books that are suppressed and even read some things where a lot of people say, well, this was not so because this and this and this. Make up your own mind by doing your own study. I repeat this last sentence. American Catholicism was, in its inception, wholly a Jesuit affair and has largely remained so. It does not become too clear, I think, in this context that I'm reading this part of Rulers of Evil, what American Catholicism was. You have to understand that, and this is what Tom very, very well explains in the reading of rulers uh, in, in the reading of the Global Vatican. The Catholics, when they were young, over there in the United States of America, plead to the Pope that they could have their own structure and that they could have their own Catholicism, not putting the Pope on the top, as it normally would be, of course, in the Roman Catholic Church, because they said they would otherwise diminish us in this country. We would not get a foothold in this country when we do what is actually the normal Catholic policy all over the world. You, Mr. Pope, have to understand when you do that, when you ask that this hierarchy is set up here in America like it is everywhere else, out in the open, the Pope as the uh, top of the ruler, we will never gain the influence that we need to take over this country. And this is something that you really have to understand. It is not the American people that turned Catholic. It is the pulpits that turned Catholic. The Jesuits succeeded through the years by infiltrating the pulpits of Protestant churches and by even founding all these different Protestant churches. Like, for example, they were on the basis of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. They were on the basis on the Jehovah Witnesses. They have infiltrated the Baptists, they have infiltrated the Methodists, they have infiltrated the Lutheran Church. And by infiltrating the Church and infiltrating their seminaries and teaching from their pulpits, they turned it all back into the Church of Rome. And the American Catholicism was, like it's stated here, in its inception, wholly a Jesuit affair and has largely remained so up to today. But... Now we have September 2015 and within a few days, we have today the 9th of September, within two weeks the Pope is coming over to the United States of America and then you will see that there is no difference between American Catholicism and Roman Catholicism anymore. Now they can play that card in the open. And don't forget Always remind yourself of that. Pope Antichrist Francis I, who comes over to the United States of America, is a Jesuit who has pledged the vow, the fourth vow of the Jesuits. And I have other broadcasts and videos where I go into that vow. I probably will do another, but otherwise look it up for yourself. That is what Catholicism is all about. They needed a foot in the door and they got it. And they even hit themselves under so-called American Catholicism. Well, you know, okay, it's Catholicism. But it's not Roman Catholicism. So, we are not your enemies. We preach another gospel. <laughs> that's what they tell you. That's not what they do, but that's what they tell you. And that's how they put the Protestants to sleep. Because otherwise there would have been a big, big war within the first few years after the founding of the United States of America. If the people on the street understood how, with what intentions, and with what, with what casuistry and sophistry their country was founded, they would have thrown the whole government out. Because the people 
were righteous. The people were patriotic to a country, to their country. Their leaders only pay allegiance to Rome. That's the difference. That was the difference in 1776 and that is the difference today. Okay, continue reading. America's first Anglican bishop ordained in 1784 was Reverend Samuel Seabury of Connecticut. Reverend Seabury was a high churchman and a Freemason. To avoid the political repercussions of swearing allegiance to the Church of England so soon after 1776, Seabury was consecrated in November 1784 at Aberdeen in Scotland. Of critical importance to Rome was that the three bishops consecrating Seabury were all non-juring bishops. Non-juring described the class of Catholic bishops that stood in the succession of Jacobite, uh, of Jacobite clergy, who, remaining loyal to King James II after his abdication, uh, ab abdication, sorry, after his abdication in 1689, had refused to take a loyalty oath to James' successor, his daughter Mary Stuart, and son-in-law William of Orange, both Protestants. America's first Protestant bishop, like his Roman Catholic counterpart, owed allegiance to Rome. This obscure fact is commemorated in one of London's most heavily trafficked and world-famous locations. The spacious grassy lawns on either side of the great stairway leading up to the National Portrait Gallery facing Trafalgar Square are identical except for their bronze statuary. One piece alone placed at the center of each lawn. On the north lawn stands James II, crowned with imperial laurel, wearing the armor of Julius Caesar. An elderly British Jesuit with a passion for, for offbeat historical detail confided to me that James loved to go in Caesarian drag. On the south lawn stands the celebrated Houdon figure of George Washington, garbed in period attire, leaning for support upon a huge bundle of rods from which projects the head of an axe, the fascis, ancient emblem of Roman legal authority. When Bishop Seabury united his episcopate with Two, with the two other Anglican communions in America in 1789, the Protestant Episcopal Church in the United States was born. George Washington was a member of this church. The London Statuary are explaining the little-known historical fact that James II, Roman Catholic rulership of the English-speaking people, was resumed in the first president of the Constitutional United States of America. It is a tribute to the phenomenal generate of Lorenzo Ricci. John Carroll spent his final years in Europe helping to develop Lorenzo Ricci's vision of rebellion in America. He moved cautiously and often incognito. What few traces he left behind are quite revealing and we will learn of that in the next chapter and the next chapters because there's still a lot to learn about the rulers of evil now first I'm gonna make a comment that my good friend in Oregon in the United States wrote on this chapter 16 of rulers of evil it goes like this quote now it becomes real clear why George Washington outlawed Guy Fawkes Day, and that he came out of a Jacobite Freemason lodge, and the fact that it is rumored he died a Catholic. It can historically be said that Washington was a Roman sympathizer. Yes, the Jesuits were suppressed in 1773 and resurfaced with Adam Weishaupt and the Bavarian Illuminati in 1776. 
The Jesuits then founded America in 1776 and re-entered in 1814 as Jesuit educators in the country that they founded, the United States of America. And now the average person, now, today, the average person does not even know who the Jesuits are and what is their agenda. Their agenda was to break the colonies away from Protestant England and to make legal in America what was illegal in England. And what was that, remind you? The Catholics were not allowed to hold in public a Mass. They couldn't have their celebration of the Eucharist. It was forbidden in colonial times. And then came this wonderful freedom of religion. I have one problem with freedom of religion. Let me ask you one question. Is there freedom of religion in countries where the Roman Catholic Church rules superior? Is there freedom, or was there, let me put it that way, was there freedom of religion in the Israel of the Old Testament? Or did God intervene again and again and again and again when the Israelites became apostate of their belief to him? And is there religious freedom in the kingdom of Jesus Christ? Do you think that there is freedom in the kingdom of Jesus Christ? Freedom of religion? You can worship any God that you want in the kingdom of Jesus Christ? Well, I personally do not think so. And it's not only thinking, it's by when you read and understand and study your Bible, you will understand that there is then no religious freedom. But, of course, the Roman Catholic Church always promotes religious freedom in countries where it does not reign superior. Just until the moment the Roman Catholics take over. Then there is no religious freedom. But then there is the rule of law. And the rule of canon law. And the rule of the Inquisition. That you can study. It happened. It's historical facts. Please. There are more books than you will probably read in your whole lifetime about that out there that you can study on the Inquisition. And did you know that the Inquisition even was carried out in the, uh, in the 1970s still in Spain with all the torture armature they used throughout the ages that was still used in the 1970s by Franco, the fascist leader of Spain until, I don't know, when did he die? 1976 or something? I remember it was some morning when I went to school and I heard that on the radio that Franco died and I didn't, didn't even have an idea what he was because I was about 9 or 10 years old. I didn't get that stuff. But I remember that. And he even used the torture, the same torture that was used throughout history to torture and kill the martyrs and the saints of Jesus Christ. The ones who upheld the law of Jesus Christ, who defined their freedom of conscience based on the word of God, which is what the Roman Catholic Church hates. And did you know that the Bible was put on the index of forbidden books by the Roman Catholic Church? during their reign in the 1260 years of the Dark Ages, and it still is. Well, probably not the Roman Catholic Bible. They have not that big trouble that you read that. But they certainly have a problem when you read the Textus Receptus.
which is the 1611 King James Bible. Anyway, turn back to the comment that Walt Stickel made. Going back up a little. Their agenda was to break the colonies away, the Jesuits. Their agenda was to break the colonies away from Protestant England and to make legal in America what was illegal in England. To eliminate the papal code be enforced. It could have eradicated English Catholicism. The American Revolution turned all this around. Liberty was given to Rome to say the Mass, and history tells us how successful they have been. What is amazing is how they swept the English history prior to 1776 out of the minds of the world. I have to add one little thing here, because Walt is absolutely right. When you ask any American on the street about their history, they said, well, it all started in 1776. So you had Christopher Columbus, who so-called discovered the country of the United States, or the continent of America, in 1492. And then you had 200 years blank, from 1492, uh, almost 300 years, to 1776. Almost 300 years blank. No history. Oh yeah, a few people came over here, habitated the, uh, habitated the land, and then all of a sudden there was the United States of America. There was history before 1776. And because the American people are not told their true history before the time of 1776, not only concerning the United States of America or the colonies at that time, but even studying and getting taught the history of Europe, the church history, the protestant history of that time, that is why people today turn away from protestantism and go into evangelical churches and are being caught by the ecumenism that started with Vatican II between 1962 and 1965. And that was an ultimatum. Vatican II was there to confirm everything to the point that was set uh, 400 years ago, 400 years before that, what was it? 1545 to 1563, so that's 400 years between 1563 when the Council of Trent ended and 1963 when Vatican II started. And Vatican II did not take anything away from the Council of Trent. No, it confirmed everything. And when you do not know what the Council of Trent was all about, then I ask you to do your own research into that and read the more than 100 anathemas that were laid on the Protestants at that time. And don't think that I blow up the Protestants here, because they have done their mistakes in their time also. And when you go to the video that I made some time ago, Nothing But The Truth, Why Didn't The Reformers Go All The Way, you can hear that me reading that part that comes out of the Council of Trent when the Bishop of Reggio told when you Protestants say that you keep to sola scriptura but you keep Sunday as your Sabbath and there is no scriptural reference for that. You Protestants are just rebels and do not lean for 100% as you state on the word of God. This is, ladies and gentlemen, how important the real knowledge of the Bible, of the Textus Receptus, and the keeping of it, and the keeping of all ten commandments, one, two, three, four, five through ten, is especially the fourth commandment. Keep holy the Sabbath day, because in six days God made the world and rested on the seventh day. 
when the Roman Catholic Church and the hierarchy of it takes off the Sabbath that God installed and places their own, whose God are you worshipping? It will only be a question of time, of little time, I can assure you, when we all come to be faced with the same question. Are we gonna be like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego? Or are we gonna fall down to the statue made of gold? and worship a man instead of our Father who is in heaven, who sent his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, two thousand years ago to take off the sins of the world. As John said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Who are you rescued by? Who are you saved by? A man or Jesus Christ? I cannot answer that for you. That is something everybody has to make his own peace with it. But remember, Revelation 12, verse 9, quote, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. How, 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 sorry, how, how many parts of the world did he receive? A third? A half? Three quarters? A piece? No which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. When it comes to the founding of America, the whole world is deceived. The masking, making it like it was instrumented by the Protestants, and founding of America was brilliantly done by the Jesuits. A military order of the Vatican. The most cruel militant order the Vatican has ever produced. The Jesuits, who control all our lives, whether we like it or not. There is a solution. Turn to Jesus Christ. That's the only solution. There is no solution in this world. Because Jesus said it himself. If my kingdom was of this world, my soldiers would fight. But my kingdom is not from hence. So, thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this chapter 16 as much as I did. And I'm very much looking forward to the next parts of reading and doing it. And please comment on the video what you think of it. But make sure when you comment that you are spiritually honest, point one. And that when you quote the Bible or whatever, that you have the right foundation to stand on, the King James Version. When you stand on that Bible, when you stand on the true Word of God, you've built your conscience, you've built everything, your trust, you build it on a rock and not on sand. And there's a nice parable Jesus told you about that, right? I think it's in Matthew. Look it up. And for the rest, keep on doing your own studies. Read the book Rulers of Evil or other books for yourself. Educate yourself, because the state has no interest in educating you, except for what you will bring for him on taxes and money. But we should not lay up treasure in this world, we should lay up our treasure in heaven. Start doing that. Find your peace, and you will see this world can do whatever it wants. It will never come to a solution. Because man cannot provide a solution. God can provide a solution. And God provided the solution. And you can be a part of God's kingdom forever and ever and ever. Thank you for listening. And until next time, God bless you all. And bye-bye.